Father, as we come together on this, your holy day, to again study from your word, we just ask, dear Lord, that you would bless us with the presence and with the guidance of your spirit. Give us clear and understanding minds and receptive hearts, dear Father, for we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, as you can see, we are going to do, be doing part two of the study on biblical stewardship. We've been looking at lost truths in the Bible, Bible teachings that are not taught or even understood by many Christians today. And we've gone through different ones, several of them, uh, over the last several weeks. And today, as we continue looking at the one on stewardship, we saw last week that stewardship consists of more than just money. Most people think that when they hear the word stewardship, they're thinking of money, giving money. But we saw that stewardship involves everything that God has entrusted to us. So money's just one of them. When Adam and Eve were put on this planet, there was no money, but they were stewards. And their assignment was to take care of the things that God created. So we are stewards of this planet, for one thing. We are stewards of our time, the time that God has given us. We are stewards of our bodies, which are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Uh, we are stewards of the abilities that God has given us on how we use or refuse to use what's been entrusted to us. So stewardship actually entails every aspect of life. And until one comes to understand that they are a steward, and we saw last week that everyone is a steward. Some are good stewards and others are bad stewards. People in the church, people out of the church, Christians, non-Christians, everybody on this planet is to be a steward. It's just very sad that most stewards are unfaithful in their stewardship. And so where we concluded last week, we were on page three there of your workbook, and it said a steward is one who manages an estate for another, and we are to manage God's estate for him. God created this world, everything in this world belongs to God, and we saw in the parable that we looked at last week, he said that he entrusted this to his stewards and said that he takes a journey to a far country and after a time he comes back and reckons with his stewards. And this far country that Jesus traveled to was to go and prepare a place for us. And that's why he told us in John that I go to prepare a place for you and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. And so Jesus now is, is there preparing a place for us and he will soon return to receive his faithful stewards and to take them home. But in the parable, he says, those that are unfaithful will be cast into outer darkness where there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. And so in the parable of Luke 12 that we're going to look at in a little bit, we will find that heaven's goods are entrusted to us, therefore faithfulness is required of us. And for those that are not familiar, if you see the words that are capitalized and underlined, that is to be filled out in your workbook. And so we see that all of heaven's goods have been entrusted to us to care for, for God until he comes back and that we are to be faithful in our responsibilities to God. So when Jesus soon returns, I want to hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I don't know about you, but I don't want to hear him say, depart from me. You see, we all will hear one or the other of the two. 
and we must be faithful to him. So as faithful stewards, we need to make the best possible use of everything that God has entrusted to us and use it not for ourselves, but for the owner who is God himself. Too often we've heard people say, well, it's mine. You know, we kind of start that at a very early age. I, every one of my kids, I had to deal with them very young. It's mine, it's mine, it's mine. They don't want to share. And that kind of, the older we get, the stronger that sometimes gets inside of us to where we even today jokingly say, what's yours is mine and what's mine is mine. But nothing in this world belongs to us. And I gave you an example of that last week. Can you tell me something that is yours? That you really own, huh? Okay, somebody was paying attention last week. The grave. It's not your house. It's not your car. It's not your clothes. It's God's. And that's why people are so wrong when they use this very common phrase today. Well, it's my body. No, it's not. We have been bought with a price. And the body also belongs to God. So nothing in this world is really ours. We are to care for these things until Jesus comes back. And so when we do that, we must seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then Jesus says all these other things will be added to us. That's a promise that he's given to us. And it's a promise that we should truly come to not just know, but to actually believe. Jesus promised this in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. And here's but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So you see, the promise is there. We're to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then all, there's a missing E there, these things needful in this life will be added to us. But do we believe that? Most people say they do, but most people really do not believe that because if they did, they would be living a little bit differently. We see that the trouble with many is that they make the added things first and then hope the kingdom will be added to them. They want to put the things of this world first and then if there's time and if it doesn't inconvenience them too much, they would like to be in the kingdom of heaven. And it just does not work that way. We must put the kingdom of God and his righteousness ahead of everything else or I can guarantee you here today you will not be in that kingdom because you will not have received his righteousness. So we've got to understand that God owns everything, including us, and that he provides everything for us as needed. So whatever necessity there is for us to aid in the advancement of God's cause, he has purposely arranged for our good and not for his necessity. God is not dependent upon us for anything because everything's already his. But he's made arrangements so that anything that is for our good, he will provide it for us. I didn't hear you. Well, yeah, you cannot give away what's not yours in that sense, true. So here, here's something we've got to understand in, in this. If it is bad for us, God doesn't want us to have it, does he? That's why the Bible actually forbids 
certain things. God governs what we can and cannot or should and should not eat and drink. God governs everything and he will withhold no good thing from those who love him. And so if God says, do it, it's for our good. If he says, don't do it, it's for our good, but for our bad if we do not listen to him. So that's an important thing to understand there. He has greatly honored us by making every one of us co-workers with him. And he helps us remove selfishness. And now here's a question. How much are we to give? Everything. Everything. And so when one does that, then they have begun to understand that it's all his anyway. You know, it's like a story I, I read once a long time ago about an old Indian chief that was attending some evangelistic meetings. And the pastor was making an appeal for people to come forward and put their best on the altar for God. And the old Indian, he got up and he went up front and he lay his bow and arrow on that altar up there. And he went back and he sat down and but the pastor kept going on for people to come, put their very best up there. And after a while, the old man got up again. He went up there and he took his headdress off and he laid it on the altar and he went back and sat down. And the preacher still was going, and I know how them preachers can just keep going on sometimes. And he went back again, the preacher still going, Come and put your very best. Give, hold nothing back from God. And the old man got up again. He went up to that altar and he wiped the stuff off of the altar and he crawled up there and laid down himself. And that's what God wants from us, us. Now, once you give him yourself, everything else comes with it. And so the faithful servant who invests himself or herself along with their time and talent and treasure in the cause of God to save souls and employs all their means to the glory of God, these people will receive the commendation of the master, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. But first, we've got to give ourselves everything about us and that will then include all of the rest of the things. Our purpose is to reach out and save people. Jesus came to this world and he says, I came to seek and to save what? The lost. Now he now turns around and says to us, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. And so that should be something that motivates us and everything that we have will then go to that glorifying God and being laborers together with him. What is the joy of the Lord? Well, when you study in the scriptures, you'll see it is the saving of souls, seeing souls in the kingdom of heaven. And so Jesus the son of the living God despised the shame and agony and came into this world to save souls. Is it possible that we don't want to experience shame and suffering and inconceivable hardship? Is it possible that we want it better than our Lord had it? Do we perhaps think that we deserve more than Jesus Christ? We, my friends, are to work together with the one who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Remember, he left his royalty. We are to deny self and take up the cross, but we tend to lavish more and more on ourselves. We want the fanciest cars and the designer clothes and the 
most expensive homes. And when we do that and we make that our priority, we are telling the world that this is our home, that we are not pilgrims and we are not just passing through. But here Jesus laid aside his glory. He sacrificed his riches. He clothed his divinity with humanity. And all this he did in order that he might reach fallen man with the gift of eternal life. If we would use less of our possessions in adorning the body and beautifying our houses, if we were to consume less, less in extravagant health-destroying foods, we would place much greater sums in the treasury of the Lord, much more time in working together with the Lord. And thus we would imitate our Redeemer who left heaven, left his riches, left his glory, and for our sake became poor that we might have eternal riches. So shall the world's Redeemer practice self-denial and sacrifice for us while we, the members of his body, practice self-indulgence. Self-denial is an essential condition of discipleship, which is an essential condition of entrance into heaven. I want you to think about that one for a moment. Self-denial is an essential condition of discipleship. Jesus says, you've got to give up everything you have and follow me. Remember the rich young ruler said, what, what must I do? And it said he went away sorrowful because he had much wealth. And so you cannot be a disciple and you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven unless you are a disciple. I don't care what these evangelical preachers and ecumenical movement people are telling you. There is one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. There is no other name given under heaven given among men whereby men must be saved. That's what scripture says. And we must follow his plan. The spirit of liberality is the very spirit of heaven. But the spirit of selfishness is the spirit of Satan. And so inspiration makes it clear that sin originated in self-seeking. Anytime you put yourself above, and this DA, for those that don't know, that's the Desire of Ages, page 29. Anytime that you put anything else above God, then it is self-seeking. Christ's self-sacrificing love is revealed upon the cross. He gave everything he had, then he gave himself that we might be saved. And the cross of Christ should appeal to the generosity of every follower of the blessed Savior. The principle illustrated in the sacrifice of Jesus is to give and to give and to give because you cannot outgive God. And so what we see is to carry the truth to the inhabitants of the earth, to rescue them from their guilt and indifference is the mission of the followers of Christ. That is our mission, to take the truth to every person on planet Earth. When you look at the three angels' message, there was an angel flying in the midst of heaven with the everlasting gospel to proclaim to everybody. So where does everybody start? wherever you happen to be. And then from there, it reaches out into your neighborhood, into your city, into your state. Isn't that what Jesus said? Go first into Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, and then to the othermost parts of the world. There is no limit, no boundaries to the commission that God has given us that this gospel is to be preached to every kindred tongue, nation, and people. And that is essential to our understanding of our purpose for being here because men must have the truth 
in order to be sanctified through it. And we, my friends, are the channels of God's light. Our talents, our means, our knowledge are not merely for our own benefit. They are to be used for the salvation of souls. And that is the reason for our existence. Have you ever stopped to think, why am I on planet Earth? Why in the world am I born? What's my purpose for being here? To get rich? To outdo my neighbors? To multiply like rabbits? No. It is to carry the gospel to a lost world. It is to labor for our master as we await his return to get us. This is the reason. This is the purpose of the church. You know, just tossing something out here for a minute. Why do people go to church? Is it because they feel like they have to fulfill some sort of an obligation? I know some people that that's exactly why they go. Is it so that you can go visit your friends? Because you love the Lord, okay. Um, but what about those who want to go and show off their new clothes or their Easter bonnet or whatever? You know, I know people that went to church once a year and it was on Easter and it was simply to show off their Easter clothes. I knew several people that did that. Is it perhaps you go to church to be entertained? I mean, that's one of the reasons that they have the kind of music that they have in so many churches today. Or they bring in actually magicians. They have magic shows and tricks, sleight of hand. Or they bring in these drama teams to do theatrics, theatrical presentations to, to solicit belly laughs from the congregation. Some of the things that I have seen in churches as I've traveled a whole lot of different places are really heartbroken, heartbreaking. But I ask the question here, should the reason for going to church be to hear the word of God? Try this for an experiment sometime. Just ask people. You go to church? Why do you go to church? See what kind of answers you get from that. Why do you go to the particular church that you go to? You'll get things, well, it's close to my house. That's an interesting one. Or it's, it's a beautiful architecture. They have a great choir. They have wonderful children's programs. I'll bet you anything that you will seldom get the response because the word of God is preached there. Seldom will you hear that. Um, our reason for going to church really should be to get to know the will of God, to experience the love of God, and to be empowered to the, share the things of God with others. You had a thought back here, Salvador? No, they really don't. A lot of them go because mom and dad did or, you know, it's just something that we feel we're supposed to do. People really need to ask themselves why they do what they do. Now, let's go back to this for just a moment. We're going to be looking at some more parables in just a little bit here. Do you realize that two-thirds of the parables of Scripture deal specifically with stewardship and most with money in particular? Two-thirds of the parables deal with stewardship. And most of those dealing with money, the money aspect of stewardship. When you look in the Bible, you'll find that there are more than 2,000 references to money in God's Word. Pardon me? 
I don't have that there, the two-thirds. It isn't? Is it on the new one? Maybe it's not on the Oh, that's because, uh, yeah, I got... Uh, I worked on this some more this week and put some more stuff in it. That's why you got new sheets. So if you got an old sheet, the two-thirds, the two-thirds is on the new one, right? Okay, it is on the new one. So switch over to the new one. I do not know. Okay. Now, more than 2,000 reference to money in God's word. Do you know that that's more references than there is to the Sabbath? There's more references to that than the state of the dead or the investigative judgment. There's more reference to that than to prayer or temperance. The only thing that exceeds that is the second coming. But stewardship and money and the second coming of Jesus are very close together in the number of references in the scripture. And you know, the reason for that is very simple. Stewardship and the second coming are irrevocably related. For the faithfulness of the one will determine the preparedness of the other. If you're not faithful in your stewardship, you will not be ready to meet Jesus when he comes back. You know, I've got uh, some books at home that contain... Wesley's sermon, John Wesley's sermon. I was one really powerful Methodist preacher. When I was in Europe or in England here a few years ago, I went around to a lot of the places where Wesley went and preached and where they tried to stone him. And I mean, the things that happened to this man because he preached powerfully the things of God's word. And he was preaching a sermon once and the sermon had three parts to it. And the first part was uh, 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 very interesting because as he developed each part, there were some hearty amens that came from the congregation, especially one gentleman kind of sitting up front there. And the first part of Wesley's sermon was to go and earn as much money as you can. And boy, that guy up front said, amen. And I mean, he was just really supportive of that portion of the sermon. As Wesley moved into the second part of his sermon, he said God's people should save as much money as they can. And again, this old fella just came out with some very hearty amens, a lot louder than all the others in the congregation. But when he got to his third point, part, Wesley said that God's people should give as much money as they can. That old brother was awfully quiet. There were no amens from him whatsoever. And at the end of the sermon, this one man came up to Wesley and said, you know, that would have been a wonderful sermon today if you hadn't gone and spoiled it with that last point. And that's pretty much the attitude of people today. Make as much, save as much, but you don't want to give anything. You know, that's what I was told as a little boy. I was just a little bitty kid. And these folk from a church there in town would come and pick me up and take me to church and then take me to get an ice cream cone. I've told you some of the stories about that stuff. But uh, my dad would tell me, son, all they want is your money at that place. And my mother would always give me a handful of pennies. Pennies were worth something back in the 50s. You do know that. And she'd give me a handful of pennies and I'd go off to church. And, but I'd always think about what my dad was telling me. All they want is your money. And I began to notice, well, they were asking for a lot of offerings. They had an offering in their Sunday school class. Then they had a, an offering in church. Oftentimes they had a special offering for something. My pennies did not go very far. And I didn't get to come home with any pennies. Never stopped to realize that the pennies that I put in there 
wouldn't have even paid for the ice cream cone I got. And the ice cream cones were only a nickel back then. And so, but that stayed with me for years. Are God's people just after money? Is God reliant upon our funds to make his work progress? Quite simply, a little short phrase here. Man may put God out of his mind, but he will not put God out of business. It will not happen. You know, as you're going to see, I, I do read occasionally, and I read another story a long time ago about a man who was out soliciting for funds in something that was called in gathering. That's kind of dead and buried and patted down pretty firmly now, I think. But he went to one business, and as he was solic soliciting in this business in town, the owner of the place said, listen, it's only 10 o'clock in the morning, and you're the fifth person to be in here asking for money today. I've faced that before. <laughs> I know what it's like. And he said, it's against our policy to give and the minister just looked at him for a moment and said, well, don't you think you ought to change your policy? And um, the man says, well, why is that? He says, well, one day you are going to die and you know you can't take it with you. That sounds like something Ron Halverson would have said. If you don't give to the Lord now you will just leave it to someone else to squander the man thought about that for a few minutes and he said yes I guess you're right we can take the only thing we can really take with us is about three by six feet of sod and the minister thought to himself we don't even take that. It takes us. We can put him out of mind, but we cannot put him out of business. All right, we're going to go take this look at this parable in Luke. Jesus and this, if you, those who want to, to follow along in the Bible, it's Luke 12, 16 to 21. I uh, don't want to do this to discourage you from going into the scriptures, but for some who may not have it with them. Jesus spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? This man had such a bountiful harvest, he did not have enough stories to put everything. That's really quite a bumper crop, wouldn't you think? And it goes on and says, and he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. That's now in verse 19. And I will say unto my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease and eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? Quite a story, isn't it? I got all of this stuff and I'm going to just store it all up. Uh, I, you know, I, I, all I'm interested in is me and what I've got. I'm going to build new barns, fill everything up. And I'm going to eat, drink, and be merry. And while he's rejoicing in all of his great abundance, God says to him, you fool. You're going to be dead before the sun comes up. This night, your soul shall be required of you. You are going to be dead before morning. And now who is all of this going to belong to? How many here today can guarantee me you'll see the sun rise tomorrow morning? 
None of us. You know, life is the most uncertain commodity on planet Earth. It can be extinguished at any moment. And it's not bad enough to where you just have to worry about a heart attack, stroke, or somebody running over you, but now they walk in and shoot you regardless of where you're at, even in a church. Your life could be gone before the day is. And what you have, have you made arrangements for it? I want to tell you now, let me insert a little something in here. If you do not have a will or a trust drawn up, shame on you. You need to have that done because if you don't take care of it while you're alive, Uncle Sam will take care of it after you're gone. And he'll hold a good portion for himself. And if you would like and do not have a will or a trust, you see me, I'll give you a phone number that you can call and they will prepare you one free of charge so that you have put God first while you're alive so that he will still be first after you're gone. Yes. Then you better put it in writing if you want it. Well, I have a man here who is an attorney. Just saying, I want it. I'm facing this right now. I'm a trustee for an estate right now. I'm having to do real battle over something that was actually in the will, but there was one little thing that was not in this one that anytime I have anything with helping people draw up one, I will have a phrase put in there like I did with my father-in-law that anybody can, that can test this is automatically excluded from it. And that helps a lot, but... No, if you say you want it to go to your children, you better give it to your children while you're alive or you better put it in a legal document so that it does do that. Yes. Yeah, see, and this varies from state to state too. In Texas, it won't go to your children. Yeah, so, so yeah, don't just think that. Put it in writing. If you're young enough and you've got kids, let me tell you, you better have something in there to take care of your little kids. I learned that when I was very young. I figured I'd be killed in a car wreck many years ago because I lived in that car so much. And so I wanted to know what was going to happen to my children if Mary and I happened to be killed together in a car accident. I knew I did not want them to go to my family. I really did not. And that may sound kind of harsh, but it's not. My concern was the children. And I found very dear Christian friends that I talked with that said they would be willing to take charge of my children. By the grace of God, I got to see them all grow up. Um, but make sure everything is cared for. Little children, your older children, your house, your bank account, whatever it happens to be. Even your car. Yes. That's one of the most important things if you've got young kids. Where do you want them to go? Who do you want to have custody of the kids if something happened to you? Uh, the state's not going to do that for you. Uh, no, you they have won't. have no idea where those kids are going to go if you don't put it out. Yeah, and they'll be separated. That was something else I had to have in there. They were not to be separated. The, remember, this is still a part of stewardship. The state will tell you that your children are not yours, they belong to them. But the word of God says, the children are an heritage unto the Lord. Your children belong to God. You're just to care for them until he comes back to get us all. That's part of stewardship. But I don't want to go into a, a big commercial on this, but please, if you do not have some legal document like that, a will or a trust or something, then all you got to do is tell me, I will give you the phone number and somebody will come from the conference office. They do it for you. They don't charge you for it. And you're protecting yourself and your family. But let me, let me move on to this. 
I want to look at one more. Matthew chapter 6 this time. And uh, did I see a hand? Is there a question before I move on? Okay, Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. Watch what Jesus said. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth, where moth and rust does corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where neither moth nor rust does corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You know, this is, in the last few weeks, this has had a lot of uh, significance to me again, because where it says thieves break through and steal, in the state I'm handling right now, two hours after I left, they broke in and stole over $5,000 worth of stuff out of that house. Stuff that, uh, well, I don't even want to go into that. My friends, we must understand that where our heart and our treasures are, are closely related. You know, when you see a wino laying on the street, he's usually right close to the liquor store, isn't he? Why is he laying there in the gutter by the liquor store? Because his treasure is in there and therefore his heart is in there and we got to come to understand that. There's a story of a guy that I read once that the, he, uh, uh, he got to heaven and St. Peter, and so you know this is not a theologically correct story. It's an illustration. And St. Peter was walking him through the streets of heaven and he saw all of these beautiful mansions. And there's this mansion that belonged to one of his competitors in the business world, a big, beautiful mansion. He thought, man, if he's got that one, I can't wait to see how miraculous mine's going to be. It's got to be marvelous. And they went on through these streets of gold, and they got down to one end of one street, and they took a right and went down to a little alley. By the way, there are no alleys in heaven. And there, at the end of the alley, was this little run-down shack. And the guy says, what's that one there for? He said, well, that one's yours. No, that can't be. So-and-so had this big mansion. What do you mean, I got this shack? St. Peter said, that's the best we could do with what you sent ahead. <laughs> Not theologically correct, but the principle is there. Where your treasure is, your heart is. If your treasure is in heaven, that's because your heart's in heaven. But if it's with the local sports games or the local automobile places or the local TV show, wherever it's at, that's where you're going to put your money into it. And we are God's stewards. And it is required of a steward that he be what? Found faithful. So again, here we go with, this will probably be the last verse we get through today. It's in Matthew uh, uh, or Leviticus, I mean Leviticus. It says, speaking of the tithe. Now the word tithe simply means tenth. This is from Leviticus 27. So all the tithe or the tenth of the land, whether of the seed of the land, the fruit of the tree, is whose? The Lord's. It is what? Holy unto the Lord. And if a man will at all redeem aught of his tithe, he shall add thereunto the fifth part thereof. And concerning the tithe of the herd or of the flock, even whatsoever passes under the rod, the tenth shall be holy unto the Lord. He shall not search whether it be good or bad, neither shall he change it, and if he change it at all, then both it and the change thereof shall be holy. It shall not be redeemed. So when they harvested, 
whether it's fruits or grains, vegetables, anything that came out of the fields, the first 10% went to the Lord. It was holy to the Lord. If it's animals, whatever passed through, they'd run them through a little chute, much like they do today. That would chute would run them into a, a corral or a pen. And there would be somebody there as these animals went through and the first 10% were marked as belonging to the Lord. And it said that whether it's good or bad, notice, it's still, you're not going to switch it out, it goes to the Lord. So the tithe could be defective. In other words, a sheep that went through there that was lame, it still belonged to the Lord because it was the part of the tithe or the tenth. We're going to see when we go further in the study, that's not true of offerings. You could not give a blemished offering. But the tithe, regardless of the condition, it belonged to the Lord. So, what made it different? What made it holy? Yeah, well, that's, that's a per, an amount. What made it holy? Okay, it was the Lord. It was His by right. It's not something you're giving to the Lord. Remember, we are what? We're stewards. And it's required of us. We can use these others uh, for purposes that are, are appropriate, but the tenth, the ten percent, the tithe was holy, and that's regardless of what it is, and it belonged to God, and it went directly to God. It was holy. It's a holy tenth. So, what was that holy ten percent used for? You know, they went through, they counted off the tenth of everything. They even did it with seeds. We'll see this next week where he was going through and counting out little seeds of cumin and anise and so forth. What were they using it for? What did they set it aside for? Scripture tells us, Numbers 18, 26, Thus speak unto the Levites. Now, who were the Levites? They were the ministers, the priests in the Old Testament. And say unto them, when you shall take of the children of Israel the tithes which I have given you from them for your inheritance. So the tithe was taken and given to the Levites. Then you shall offer up an heave offering of it for the Lord, even a tenth part of the tithe. Guess what? The preachers paid tithe too. Do you see that? Of everything that came into them of that tithe, which was to use in the support of the sanctuary and the priesthood, the Old Testament proclamation of the gospel, which, by the way, the gospel was preached in the Old Testament, but that's a little something else we need to study. All of that tenth went to support the Levites or the ministers who themselves had to return a tenth part of it. So, when God set aside the tribe of Levi to minister in the sanctuary, he also made provisions as to how they were to be provided for in order that they could spend their full time in the ministry. So the tithe was for the Levites. Now, you know, there are several churches today uh, just to give you an example of something uh, that have churches or, ha or pastors who work at something else and just preach on Sundays. A lot of them do that. That's contrary to what God's plan is for ministers. They are to be given full time to the ministry of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Another interesting concept, I can remember way back in the oh, late 
70s, I was watching the news back then, and um, they were talking on the news how the average Baptist preacher was making over $40,000 a year. I don't mean I sound like a whole lot now, but back in the 70s, I remember looking at my wife and said, hmm, we're definitely not Baptists, are we? <laughs> you see, and what happens, I was in the Bahamas several years ago, and I was going around the coast on a, on a boat there, uh, and it uh, wasn't a ship, it was a boat. And uh, there was a big uh, mansion setting up there overlooking uh, the ocean there. And the guy on the tour boat was telling us that this was uh, um, belonged to a Baptist preacher. And that he owned all of the, I think it was Kentucky Fried Chicken franchises in the Bahamas. And then he went on to say, but he didn't build that from the chickens. He built it from his Baptist preacher's salary. Wow. Because in many cases, the churches, whatever, whatever comes in, I mean, let's take a guy you all know real well, Joel Osteen. How many millions of dollars do you think he brings in? And it all goes to Mr. and Mrs. Osteen. When they think it's from God, they think that God's it. Yeah. And so in many churches, the more people and the more money that are, and they call it all tithe, but it's not an honest tithe. You'll see that when you study this. They do not follow the biblical principle. But the more money that comes in, the more money the preacher gets. And that's why in many of these churches, well, preachers won't tell you anything that will upset the congregation. They're not there to present the word of God, but to keep the people happy. Because if you upset them, guess what happens to you? You're gone. You're gone. And so that's a, that's a real problem that exists today. And uh, when God set aside the tribe of Levi for the ministry, uh, he made provisions of how they were to be provided for, and that was through the tithe and offerings. And this practice is carried over to the New Testament, which is where we'll pick this up next week. But look what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians. Do you not know that they which minister about holy things, live of the things of the temple, and they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. He's talking about the Old Testament sanctuary there. And then he says, even so has the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. The Lord ordained it so that what was happening in the Old Testament priesthood now was transferred into the New Testament church. Somebody asked me we'll look at that next week. We will definitely look at that thoroughly next week in tithe and offering. I want you to let Fill this one out in your book here. God has also ordained that those who preach his word should be supported in their work by the tithe of those who receive his word, just as the Levites had been supported. Okay. Any thoughts or questions? Yes. Well, at that time, remember, the church had not really been established yet. It was in its infancy. There was no support for one thing, and also those who were in Jerusalem, they couldn't even get jobs. And so Paul also took up offerings as he traveled all around Asia and Europe to take back to the people who couldn't. So Paul worked as a tent maker with Aquila and Priscilla, because the church was just getting started and there was no uh, body, if you will, uh, that could, could give him 
money because there's a transition being made from the Levitical period to the gospel church and that's why and that's why even within our church when it first got started our guys were workers and God through the Holy Spirit said you not to do that I remember a very interesting story I want to share this before we have prayer uh, John Loughborough you know these guys got discouraged at times it was hard because there was no source of income except what they could really earn that way and he got discouraged and he went over into uh, um, Iowa out of Illinois I mean out of uh, yeah out of Illinois went across and was working over there I forgot the name of the town on the river there and God sent Ellen White to find this guy and as they traveled it was in the winter time they were traveling by sleigh and they got to the river there between Illinois and Iowa and the river had been frozen over but it had been thawing for several days so there was three or four inches of water on top of the ice now how were they going to get across because there were no bridges there and so uh, they prayed about it and the servant of the Lord says God said go across so we will go across and when word got out that they were going to take the sleigh and go across that thawing river people lined up on the Iowa and the Illinois side to watch these crazy fools fall through the ice and drown and as they got to the other side everybody started cheering because they did get across and then she went up to this place where Loughborough was working he was on a roof putting shingles on and Ellen White stayed in the sleigh and she sent word to him to come down and come to where she was at and he did and when he walked up to the sleigh the prophet of the Lord said only one thing to him she looked him square in the eye and she said what doest thou here Elijah he got the message he put his hammer up and he went back to preaching the gospel again ministers of the gospel should preach the gospel full time and not have to take time aside to make a living somewhere okay let's pray together father we do thank you so much for the privilege we've had to gather here and study your word again today and we just ask father as we conclude the class today that you would continue to have your spirit abide with us that we might be acutely aware of your presence with us throughout this holy sabbath and as we enter into the upcoming service father for we ask all of this in the name of your son jesus amen